Charlene Eisenberg videotaped her baby girl for the first time. That's a pretty girl. That's a pretty girl. She's so smart. It was November 24, 1997. Marlene and Steve find their daughter's crib empty in their Hillsborough County, Florida home. They have an older son and daughter were safe in their beds. Here is the 911 call that Marlene Eisenberg made to the Hillsborough County, Florida dispatcher. Was someone watching? Did someone know? Did someone see the birth announcement and watch for five months later, watch for an opening, and went for the child? Sabrina, come crawl to mommy. Baby Sabrina disappeared from a crib sometime through the night as her mother, father, young sister, and brother slept, and not even a bark from the family dog. Well, the mother got up to get some of the other children ready for school, and, and she had walked by the uh, infant's room and like any parent would check on the uh, infant at that point and discovered her missing. Anyone who was, uh, if it was someone who was scoping it out, if that's the word, to see the situation, if they were around enough times, it wouldn't have taken long to figure out that, that uh, they were apt to leave the garage door open. I hope and I pray and I hope everybody that's watching is on their knees praying and the person that took this child to bring her back. Tonight, we came here to pray for Sabrina. Tomorrow, we want to talk to the person who has Sabrina. Thank you for coming here to be with us. when I first heard about the disappearance of five-month-old Sabrina Eisenberg. And even to this day, without looking at a, uh, a, an internet photo or the TV monitor or a newspaper, I recall exactly what five-month-old Sabrina looked like uh, with those big eyes and the dark hair. Sabrina's disappearance was highly, highly unusual. It wasn't like she went missing at a crowded mall or was outside playing unattended at a park. She was in the home, in the home with her parents, uh, Marlene and Steve Eisenberg. They're not far from Tampa, Florida in Valrico, Florida, an upscale neighborhood. The parents seem to be well-educated, affluent, she knocked on our door at five or six minutes till seven this morning. And I said, what's wrong? I'm still in my nightshirt. And she says, our, my baby's gone, my baby's gone. Uh, what do you mean your baby's gone? You know, and uh, she said someone came in and took her baby. The baby was gone, not in her crib. We have had te peeping toms and we have had people try to open doors late at night. I'll be looking for disturbed soul and uh, anything like of that nature that, that might clue me to put the dog there or uh, if the dog hits on something obviously we'll, we'll check it out. Sabrina Eisenberg's disappearance was really shocking because this was right before Thanksgiving. This was a family who said you know they watched a Disney movie with Sabrina and their other two children who were just four and eight years old. Um, the family went to bed. Mom checks on Sabrina in her crib. Uh, at around 11, 11.30 that night. She said, you know, everything's fine. The family goes to sleep. They don't hear anything during the night. Nothing seems unusual until that morning when they wake up at about 6.30 and Sabrina is not in her crib. They just came in the house and took the baby from the crib. An unidentified hair in Sabrina's crib. There was a footprint left on the dust ruffle of her crib, not matching anyone. Uh, there was a tracking dog who tracked Sabrina's scent across the yard of the Eisenbergs. There was a neighbor who awakened in the night to say that her dog 
was barking, not loudly, but her dog was barking. Another neighbor saw headlights coming into their cul-de-sac. Uh, there were unidentified fingerprints at points of entry to the Eisenberg home. You know, this was every parent's worst nightmare. You know, over the last decade, couple of decades, we've had lots of cases where babies went missing. Unfortunately, most of those cases are resolved, and unfortunately, in most of those cases, the baby turns out to be dead. We just don't know here. This case was a mystery in 1997, and it's just as big a mystery today. When your eight-year-old son asks when the next time he can come home and see his little sister smile at him as she crawls to him, what do you say when your loving wife wonders aloud, how could this happen to us? How do you give her the strength and the hope for the future? The parents are the victims, and they have more information of who may have done this than anyone else. And so that's the reason for extensive interviews with them, is to find out uh, anything that may, they may be able to tell us as to who may have done this. The story didn't make sense to me. And I don't think that the parents' story made sense to police either. The Eisenberg said that they had gone to bed that mommy checked on her five-month-old baby girl around 11, 11.30 p.m. That everything was quiet through the night. And then around 6.30 a.m., she checked and Sabrina was missing. Now, here are the other factors, which just rubbed a lot of court watchers and a lot of legal eagles the wrong way. The Eisenbergs said that they left the kitchen door unlocked. The kitchen door led to the garage. They said the garage door was up. They also said the alarm was turned off. The dog that lived inside, it was an indoor outdoor dog, never barked. Immediately they called 911 uh, Marlene Eisenberg even said, you know, she was so hysterical, so upset that she was, you know, losing control of her bodily functions. I think because of their story, because of statistics weighing heavily against the Eisenbergs, police, like me, raised their tentacles. It didn't fit together. All of that didn't make sense at first blush. Police then focused almost solely on the Eisenbergs. And, and that does make sense that they would. They went to a grand jury where in the matter of their missing five-month-old girl, Sabrina, they both pled the Fifth Amendment. They invoked their right to remain silent as the grand jury investigated the disappearance of baby Sabrina. Someone came into our home and took our baby Sabrina Page out of her crib and took her out of our home. And I'm begging that person to please bring our baby back to us. She needs her mother and her father. My baby is five months old and she knows who we are. She knows her mommy, she knows her daddy, she knows her sister Monica and her brother William. And we all miss her and love her very much and we need her to come home to us, please. And I'm just begging that you please bring her home to her family. It all went sideways with the cops' enthusiasm, let me say, for solving the case. They got a warrant, as they should have, to put in a wiretap in the Eisenberg home. Now, the wiretap existed in the bedroom, the Eisenberg's bedroom and their kitchen, where police rightfully believed that most conversations would take place. From that point on, the case went right down the tubes because apparently on the wiretap were two 
rookies that had never done wiretaps before. So as the police built their case on the wiretaps, what they said they could hear, nobody else could hear that. Basically, we uh, woke up one morning and uh, Marlene noticed that Sabrina was missing. She screamed, I came, and uh, we saw that uh, she wasn't there. Uh, we quickly called 911 uh, as we thought we should do to get the police over to help us find our daughter. Um, and then shortly after that, the police were sitting across from Marlene, uh, accusing her of having something to do with our daughter's disappearance. On this, the 73rd day since Sabrina Eisenberg's disappearance, her parents, Marlene and Steve, came here to the federal courthouse in Tampa under subpoena from a grand jury investigating the baby's disappearance. But their lawyer successfully convinced a federal judge there were doubts about the legitimacy of the subpoenas. When the police tell the prosecutors, we hear them talking about cocaine. We hear the Eisenbergs talking about, it's your fault, you did it, talking about Sabrina's disappearance and death. Nobody could hear that on the wiretaps. They were so, for lack of a better word, staticky. Nobody, not two judges, not anybody else, could make out exactly what the Eisenbergs were saying. So it all fell like a row of dominoes because of one bad wiretap at all. The whole case just fell. This agency, along with the FBI and FDLE, have traveled to 31 states. We've conducted over 1,600 interviews, uh, followed up on 1,100 leads. And that's not what you consider a non-professional investigation. They literally, it was that, that same day, and they said, we believe you know where Sabrina is or what happened to her. They just basically said that um, statistics show, you know, that, that it's the parents that, that do these things or know what happened to their children. And so basically they came in with that preconceived idea and they stuck with it. When you inspect the things that were suspicious about the Eisenberg family, there are cogent explanations for what we or others assumed were odd scenarios. For instance, they said the home alarm had been hooked up, was in place when they bought and moved into the home, that they had never used it. Hence, it was not unusual they didn't have it on that night. They said they never locked the kitchen door, and they frequently forgot to close the garage door. Now, I don't forget to turn on my alarm, and I don't forget to lock all the doors. But you know what? That's just me. We had an alarm, but we never set it. We never used the alarm at all. Um, so it was never on? It was yeah. never on. It's something that came with the home, and we just never used it. Um, as far as the garage door and the door leading to the garage from the home, we never locked the door going from the home to the garage. That just was never locked. We never checked it to see if it was locked. It was just... That's um, how the kids would come in and out of the house during the day. Also, a, a lot of people believed that their demeanor was highly unusual. I, I recall the Eisenberg sitting on a sofa and speaking to the camera. Or they were extremely calm. The mother was calm. The dad was calm. According to the Eisenbergs, cops told them to be calm because it was going to be videoed and would be used in the search to help find Sabrina, possibly a public plea. So they had to remain calm. So their counter is, cops told us to be calm. So we were doing what we thought was best for Sabrina. Police and prosecutors also said that the mom was not hysterical when she called 911, that she was very calm. Yeah, calm down. Okay. All right, take a deep breath. What do you mean your baby's been crying? I, I just got up to wake my son up. My garage door was wide open. My, my, thing, my house to my door was wide open, and my baby's gone out of the room. How old is your baby? My baby is five months old. Two judges reviewed the 911 calls and said she was not calm at all that at one point she even handed the phone over to her husband while she got on the other phone with her mother and ultimately said, Mom, I can't talk right now. I'll call you back and hung up. 
It was all a matter of objectivity. It depended on who was looking as, at the evidence, um, which suddenly makes it no longer objective. It became subjective. There were fingerprints on our back slider that do not match uh, Marlene or mine. Uh, there was a footprint on the bed ruffle in Sabrina's room that doesn't match any of the shoes or size foot of mine or, or in our family. Uh, there was a mysterious hair in her crib. Um, also on the first day and I believe the third day, they brought dogs out to our house that uh, sniffed and indicated that somebody went out through our back door and over a back fence with yes. Sabrina. Uh, Mr. Eisenberg, it, it's been nearly four years now. Can you describe for us how your family has progressed since then and have you been able to make a new life here in Bethesda? Um, once again, the, we, we think about our daughter every day and, and the, the most important thing to us is her safe return home. And uh, we're trying to focus all our efforts on that and our other children. And a uh, matter of fact, right now we're having a tea party with our daughter Monica and some of her friends. So I want to get back to that and enjoy, uh, enjoy our family time. Now, a lot of defense attorneys will argue that polygraphs are inadmissible in a court of law. That is not true. If both parties stipulate beforehand that the polygraph will be taken and admitted in evidence, regardless of the outcome, they, they can come into evidence. And they routinely come into evidence in civil trials. Interesting, Marlene Eisenberg says police told her not one but two polygraphs were inconclusive. She also says police told her that that's understandable because of the degree of stress she was under at the time of the polygraphs. Frankly, whenever you take a polygraph, it's stressful. You don't take a polygraph in any other circumstance except a bad circumstance. You don't take a polygraph when everything's going great. You take a polygraph when something's gone horribly wrong. That's when you get strapped up to a polygraph. So everybody has stress when they take a polygraph. The father apparently passed his polygraph, which I find very interesting. Now, those were police polygraphs. Were other polygraphs taken that they passed or failed? We don't really know. Polygraphs are part of the overall investigation, and you don't hang your hat totally on uh, the results. I've seen both false positives and false negatives uh, come out. Now, the Eisenbergs insist that they did take a private polygraph and that they passed it. There are also um, two other incidents, attempted break-ins in our neighborhood within two weeks before, the, before ours, and um, also homes with babies. Now, the terrible tragedy, Marlene, is usually if there's no note there's no kidnapping kind of thing. You weren't major candidates, you're not multimillionaires. This is obviously a child apprehension for someone who wanted a child. So the odds are the child might be well be alive, but the odds are being raised by people who wanted her. So that's what well, we believe happened or, or... I mean, that's the most case in child missing, right? Usually right. it's taken by someone, when it's not a kidnapping and the parents didn't do it, it's someone who wanted a baby exactly. or a child. That's exactly, and that's 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 all we can believe in our hearts too. We we have to believe that, and and um, that's why it's so important for people that may have have had a baby come into their home just one year ago, two years ago, three years ago. Look at this child that a friend and a relative, somebody that that just can say, you know what? They had a child that came into their family a year ago, and she looks like this baby. That's what we need to happen. Both Steve and um, Marlene Eisenberg, Sabrina's parents, were charged eventually with federal charges of obstruction of, ju of justice and conspiracy. Now, those charges were eventually dropped. Um, they were based uh, um, on federal charges. They were not state charges, and they were eventually dropped. The state of Florida has never ch lodged charges against either of the Eisenbergs. Well, the police have a right to investigate the parents. Uh, that, that's a natural, responsible thing to do. In this case, however, they, they continued to stay focused on the, on the Eisenbergs without looking for any other leads, uh, and they became obsessed with the conclusion that the Eisenbergs w were responsible. And when they couldn't find facts to support that conclusion, they literally made them up. 
to the extent that they lied to a, a state judge to get a wiretap. And uh, as you well know, the wiretap produced absolutely no incriminating evidence whatsoever, despite the fact that the prosecutors uh, said all of these terribly bad things in the indictment and absolutely nothing there. The, the judge said it was pure fiction. The award of almost $3 million uh, in legal fees came as a result of they're having to defend these charges, which were ultimately dismissed, charges that were based on what the judge perceived to be misconduct, overreaching on the part of the government. And as a result, they had to pay. I believe it's because of Susan Smith and the John Benet Ramsey case, and they just figured, you know, this is this has got to be this has got to be what's happened. Was someone watching? Did someone know? Did someone see the birth announcement and watch for five months later, watch for an opening, and went for the child? Sabrina, come crawl to mommy. Baby Sabrina disappeared from a crib sometime through the night as her mother, father, young sister, and brother slept, and not even a bark from the family dog. Well, the mother got up to get some of the other children ready for school, and, and she had walked by the uh, infant's room and like any parent would check on the uh, infant at that point and discovered her missing. Pretty girl. That's a pretty girl. She's so smart. She's looking around. What's she gonna get to next? And there's big sister Monica running away. <laughs> and there she is crawling. Oh, God. 911. Hello. I need to believe my baby's been kidnapped. All right, ma'am. We are hopeful that the law enforcement authorities will continue to cover every aspect of this investigation and not just focus on one particular area. Oh Lord, you are Sabrina's refuge. A prayerful candlelight vigil for Sabrina's return, a signal, some say, that neighbors and friends are standing with the family. Many of these folks don't even know the eyes and words. Because it's hard, and I know if it was anybody close to me, I would be completely devastated. I opened the door and she said, my baby's gone, my baby's gone. And I said, what do you mean your baby's gone? And I put my arm around her shoulder and she said, somebody came in and took my baby. The fact that a mother and a father took the Fifth Amendment and invoked their right to remain silent in a grand jury proceeding that was investigating the disappearance of their five-month-old little girl has been construed by many, many legal analysts as highly unusual. They immediately hired an attorney to protect them. Now, the Eisenbergs claim they hired a lawyer because their brother is a lawyer and advised them to hire a lawyer and that they were acting under his advice. The entire investigation really rested on those wiretaps, which were in place for a substantial period of time. Because the wiretaps were improperly done, we'll never know what the Eisenberg said. We'll never know what evidence was lost. <laughs> Thank you. 
Now, the most damaging thing, publicly at least, we, we, no one's ever heard these tapes, and apparently the judge says they're inaudible, but someone in the indictment put down two statements, one by Marlene and one by Stephen. I'm going to put the statements up on the screen, read them, and then what do you make of this, since someone said they couldn't make out what the tape, but this is what reportedly was said. Marlene, they report you saying, the baby's dead and buried, it was found dead because you did it. The baby's dead no matter what you say, you just did it. And then Stephen says, according to the indictment, Honey, and this was a federal indictment, Honey, there was nothing I could do about it. We need to discuss the way that we can beat the charge. I would never break from the family pact on our story, even if the police were to hold me down. We will do what we have to do. All right, well, Steve, what did you make of that? Well, there are statements that neither of us have ever made. Um, all I can make of it is that uh, the Somebody authorities that had a very vivid imagination, and maybe from their years of dealing with uh, less than desirable people, this is uh, the scenario they came up with, or maybe they just watched too many police shows. And then they have another one of you later saying, uh, a month later saying, I wish I hadn't harmed her. And you deny saying that too. I never uh, said any of that. All right. To this day, the case of Sabrina Eisenberg has never been solved. Now, her parents, Steve and Marlene Eisenberg, say they believe she is alive somewhere and being raised by a family who wanted a baby. And we have seen instances where children are taken out of their home by intruders. They're very rare, but they do happen. So as of tonight, the disappearance of baby Sabrina Eisenberg remains a mystery. In the midst of the search for baby Sabrina, a red flag. A baby girl was up for adoption with no birth certificate, no real positive ID on her. Many states away in Illinois, the Eisenbergs seemed to be convinced that that baby girl was in fact going to be Sabrina. And police went to the great extent of having the tiny baby DNA tested. It was not Sabrina. The day that Sabrina went missing, her parents recorded a message for the media, spoke to the media in an effort to, to get help to find their daughter. Um, that that uh, was a very heartfelt, or seemed to be a very heartfelt message. It was certainly a message that chilled any other parent out there, thinking, oh my God, this could happen to me too. But it was certainly what you might expect from parents who had just lost their daughter. It put the fear of God into a lot of other parents. There was a huge search, starting with just a five-mile radius and eight or nine ponds and branching out. I mean, this was uh, an effort by multiple law enforcement agencies collaborating to dive in you know, a lot of bodies of water in Florida. We're talking about an area about 20 miles outside of Tampa. And so there are a lot of, a lot of lakes and, and areas to be searched. There was um, a massive search effort for this child. According to the Eisenbergs, the police, the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Department, did not do nearly enough immediately to search for their daughter. But as with any missing child, uh, police asked questions, police talked to neighbors, uh, there were searches, there were other locations that were checked out. The problem was, again, according to the Eisenbergs, the Sheriff's Department just didn't do enough, that there was much valuable time and possibly some valuable clues that were overlooked or lapsed simply because of the time lapse. We need Sabrina home. She needs to be with me and her father, her sister Monica, her brother William. We love her very much and need her to come home. We don't care who you are. We just want you to do the right thing. Look inside yourself, please. And drop her someplace safe. 
and called someone and tell them to come and get her so that she can come home to us. Just to add it into the mix, as if we needed, uh, you know, another unusual ingredient, the Eisenbergs insist police did not carefully and thoroughly investigate the crime scene forensically. And the Eisenbergs point to a blonde hair that was found in baby Sabrina's crib. Neither parent had blonde hair. The child, Sabrina, baby Sabrina, had very dark hair. Um, they also point to what they claim was a boot print on the skirt, the bed skirt of baby Sabrina's crib. And for those of you that are not familiar with the bed skirt, it, it, it's just simply a cloth covering like a ruffle that goes from the mattress down to the floor to cover the gap between the bed mattress and the floor. They say a boot print was there that had not been there, that they had not noticed the day before. There was a neighbor that claimed to have heard a baby crying in the wooded area behind the homes in that neighborhood. Uh, in, in the middle of the night, actually, he had let his dog out. He claimed to have heard a baby crying. Interesting that the neighbor did not call 911. Now, Mr. Eisenberg, Steve Eisenberg, was a realtor. And during their search, the police were very thorough. They actually went and dug up the yard around a home in which he had been involved in the uh, sale of that home. So clearly, they honed in on the Eisenbergs almost immediately. And statistically, the police were right, because um, normally, when a child goes missing and a member of the immediate family is involved in the disappearance, statistics are not admissible in court. They do not prove a case. You're not convicted on what uh, statistics may prove in black and white in some statistics book. That doesn't matter in a court of law. Anyone who was, uh, if it was someone who was scoping it out, if that's the word, to see the situation, if they were around enough times, it wouldn't have taken long to figure out that, that uh, they were apt to leave the garage door open. I hope and I pray and I hope everybody that's watching is on their knees praying and the person that took this child to bring her back. Tonight, we came here to pray for Sabrina. The search on the cartilage or the outlying area of the home was extensive. Police searched several bodies of water in the neighborhood, including deputies shoulder to shoulder, searching the bottom of ponds with their hands for a tiny five-month-old baby's lifeless body. They searched the entire neighborhood. They searched bodies of water all within a five-mile radius of the Eisenberg home, it turned up nothing. While the cops' instincts may have been uh, correctly placed, their follow-through bungled the case forever. And there's no do-over in the Eisenberg case. That's it. Marlene and Steve Eisenberg continue to believe that their baby who would now be 15 years old, is still alive and being raised by someone else. They are holding out hope that their family will be united someday. The investigation is still open. Investigators continue to look into tips and leads they get. I don't know if it will ever be solved, but miracles have happened. It's been a rough few years, so, but we try and concentrate on our other two children, and we try and get Sabrina's picture out every opportunity we can to... You moved away from Florida, though, right? Um, we moved back to Maryland, uh... Any particular reason? Um, to live in the house that I grew up in. Um, my dad is 
is uh, allowing us to live there. So Is the best bet that rather than being harmed, she was taken to be raised? Definitely. I, I can't believe anything else. Uh, but she still needs to, to be her, right? right. But she still needs to come home to, to us. Interesting, even after all these years, the family still releases age progression photos of what they believe little Sabrina would look like. Also, it's very important if somebody sees a child that looks like Sabrina, they need to take note of who she's with. They need to take note of what that person looks like if they're driving in a car, the license number, if they can follow them to a home or get an address, because it's, it's the public who brings home our children. And you can call your local police yes. too, right? I say interesting because the Eisenberg family is doing that, but not police. It could suggest police believe baby Sabrina is dead.